Good afternoon, and thank you very much for joining me. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to share some of my thoughts about evil, when it can be transformed, when it can be prevented, and how we should consider confronting it when neither of these possibilities are true. We will also think about what the meaning of evil might be in our landscape of life in general and in the union individuation process in specific. Let me also remind you that when we begin to study subjects like evil, a lot of emotion in history can be stirred up. So I'm going to ask you to remember that I'm sharing a point of view that I hope will stimulate and challenge you, but I'm not trying to convince you of anything. In addition, please be careful and pay attention to your own responses, because when we are discussing evil, it can invade us and affect our shadows and our vulnerabilities before we even realize it. So while I was developing this lecture, I had to remember Jung's warning in Collected Works, Volume 10, that the sight of evil kindles evil in the soul. There is no getting away from this fact. The victim is not the only sufferer. Everybody in the vicinity of the crime, including the murderer, suffers with him or her. Now, not too long ago, a friend of mine was jogging through a park in Atlanta. Suddenly, he came upon a body lying on the jogging path. My friend recognized the person lying there as a fellow jogger that he had known for years. It turned out that his fellow jogger had been robbed and murdered shortly before my friend discovered him. Now, my friend doesn't believe that he will ever get completely over this experience or that he will ever be able to jog in the way that he did before, which was free of fear. Because of how dramatically evil affects us when it's close to home, I found that it is a difficult and confusing topic to discuss. To begin with, most of us simply don't want to look at it directly. In general, we want to deny it and have it be somewhere else, like in the Middle East, Africa, the inner city. We don't deny that terrible things have happened and are happening, but we continue to delude ourselves by saying that it is somebody else, somewhere else, who is doing them. Now, in the years that I worked in the inner city, I'm glad to realize that almost without our knowing it, we have been so brainwashed by our rationalistic and materialistic ways of thinking that we have formed a frame of reference that leaves little space in our vision of life or how we think life should be for a principle of human destructiveness. And when we see the evidence of this destructiveness all around us, as my friend did, we prefer not to believe that the evils we see exist in our lives, in the sphere of our spiritual development. We prefer to think, to rationalize, and to take a simplistic, pragmatic point of view that the evil around us could be eliminated by more education, a better political system, a better economic system, better psychological conditioning, or a commitment to one more war, whether it is actual or social, or committing more fully to the religious war of good against evil. But what happens when we ask ourselves, if these things are the answer, why aren't we doing them? We don't have to follow this line of thinking very far 
And do we have to consider that evil really is a force in the world? And we need to accept that reality. But for most of us, accepting this reality challenges us to have to overhaul our whole world view. And that can be a very painful and difficult task. It usually takes a shock of some kind to force us to begin overhauling our world view. This is true because overhauling our world view means that we have to begin confronting our own shadow sides. It may also mean that we may have to cultivate and refine our powerful emotions. Pragmatists want to ignore their emotions out of the fear that they can lead them astray, which in fact repressed, crude, and uncultivated emotions actually can. But without our emotions, we are not engaged in life. We have numbed ourselves out. We have buried our passions and have trouble rousing ourselves into action and out of our passivity. When we finally act, then the things we do seem either too little, too late, or too harsh to be effective. And as analysts, we see examples of these tendencies in couples and families almost every day. Most of the time, we find it easier to live in denial, or even if we accept the force of evil as a reality, to project it far away from ourselves. It is a much more challenging task to accept Jung's advice and to begin looking into our own shadows. Looking at the demons and devils within ourselves as the foundation or starting points for looking at evil in general. It is this necessary inner journey that enables us to face the complexity of evil, the paradoxes and mysteries in it as an archetypal force, as an archetypal force, and finally, how we can face and deal with it without enabling it the way our unconscious and simplistic approaches do. I believe that if we really want to listen to you or to any of our great religious traditions and want to see the force of evil in the world realistically, or for that matter, to be able to see ourselves and truly understand how we are living, we must break out of the rationalistic materialistic way of thinking we have been born and indoctrinated into. After all, Jung is clear in his book, Modern Man in Search of a Soul, that the gods that we are called to overthrow are the idolized values of our conscious world. So then the first thing we must do is to open ourselves up to being able to look at life and into ourselves, poetically, mythologically, and symbolically. Jung says in Collected Works 18 that now we have no symbolic life, and we are badly in need of the symbolic life. Only the symbolic life can express the needs of the soul, the daily needs of the soul, mind you. Now listen carefully. Uh, these are powerful statements. Jung continues by saying, the symbolic life is the foundation of a life of depth and meaning. Without a symbolic foundation, we're in danger of pursuing make-believe lives based on cultural ideas of the good life or other people's definition of how we should live. Now, when our personal and collective lives are hollow in this sense, the door to evil is open on many unconscious levels, as we're going to see.
When we think about the symbolic life, we're reminded about the stories in mythology, whether in actual myths or in the stories of our great religions. Our timeless myths and religious stories are metaphors to give shape to and enable us to understand the universal archetypal realities which underlie our psychic experiences, our profound experiences of being human. These are also the underlying forces that can drive our lives and compel our behaviors without our knowing it when they are unconscious. Having some knowledge of this way of perceiving life is an essential requirement if we, and in my professional language, that means our egos, are going to be able to have a knowledge of and a relationship with the deeper layers of our psyche and the reality of who we are and how we are actually living. When our ego, the part of the psyche that we think of as I, our conscious mind, our everyday brain that tries to run our daily lives lacks these ways of understanding ourselves and life. We are cut off from being able to relate from ourself, that is ourself with a capital S, our own center, the ground of our personal being. Now, you defined ourself as a greater entity which includes our ego and incorporates our personal and collective unconscious. Our dreams, our great emotions, our potentials, and our life force come from the self. The archetypes of the collective unconscious dwell in the self as well. The interrelatedness of our interior life depends upon our ability to think and to feel symbolically as does our ability to have a more grounded perspective on life and a sense of inner meaning and security. In other words, for us to feel that our life has a purpose and a unique value in the scheme of things, we must be able to think and live symbolically. And without this ability and the interrelatedness within our interior lives, our ability to live without fear and to have peace of mind will be very limited. Without these interconnections, our lives will be confined to shallow levels of meaning, dry, cold, or overly sentimental ways of engaging in life emotionally, a limited capacity to give and receive love, and it will be easy for the archetypal energies within us and in our unconscious complexes to take us over and force us to live them out unconsciously. Now, many of us are aware that humanism at times sees good and evil as relative to our perceptions because this perspective often coincides with how we work with our shadows, Jung's work has frequently been confused with that humanistic point of view. However, Jung was very clear that he saw evil as real and thought we must recognize it as real. Lucifer, Satan, and the devil are archetypal images. They have different archetypal insinuations and they represent different faces of how the archetype of evil can channel our destructive energies. Now for us to be able to understand the reality of ourselves and evil as well, <coughs> it is helpful to know a little bit about archetypes and archetypal energies. In describing the nature of archetypes, Jung says in Collected Works 10, an archetype is like an old water course along which the water of life has flowed for centuries, digging a deep channel for itself. Therefore, it has become a pattern in our psyche that directs the flow of a particular portion of our life energy. 
We can see this energy through our emotional responses to it, and then through the images and ideas that they evolve from our experiences of it. For example, in the Judeo-Christian heritage, we see the destructive force of forces in life imaged in the ideas of Satan, Lucifer, and the devil, and so on. The destructive force in the world was a reality for Jung, which also meant it was an archetypal force inherent in our nature. <clears throat> The image it takes depends upon how we respond to it and how we have been taught to respond to it. The devil is an archetypal image, but it doesn't fully define the archetype, which has many different images and experiences in different cultures and religions. Jung's disagreement with the Catholic Church was that during his lifetime, the Church considered evil as an absence of good and not a reality in itself. Jung understood that we have a great reluctance to confront the many dimensions of evil, both in life and in ourselves. But he also thought that in general, Nothing could be transformed or fully dealt with unless it was first acknowledged as a reality. And that we cannot learn how to deal with the complexities of evil until we can acknowledge and confront it as a reality. So when I think about uh, talking about evil from a union perspective, I believe that we should begin in that archetypal area of our personal unconscious that we refer to as the shadow. In general, our shadow is all of the parts of ourselves, potentially good and bad, that we denied growing up. We usually repress them in our efforts to form a personality. And we want to form a personality that will be acceptable and give us as much safety as possible in our early circumstances. <clears throat> we often look to our dreams to shed some light on this area of ourselves and what is going on in it. The situation becomes more challenging when our unconscious is telling us through our dreams that we really do need to look into our shadows. So let me give you an example. Marie was a woman in her mid-40s, initially came in to see me because she was having a recurring dream. In the dream, she was being chased by women who were dressed as Nazis. They wore the brown shirts with the red armbands with swastikas on them. And in her dream, these ferocious, determined women were coming closer and closer to Marie as she towered in terror in a closet in the basement of her home. <clears throat> Marie saw them as driven, machine-like creatures who totally disregarded human and feminine values. <clears throat> the terror that Marie felt is typical of our response to evil when it threatens. In the dream, <clears throat> these female figures represent the shadow side of Marie's personality as same-sex dream figures do in Jungian psychology. The shadow, as many of you know, represents the dark, feared, unwanted side of our personality. It contains the cut-off, repressed qualities in our personalities that we rejected in order to become the person we wanted to be or needed to be so we could feel safe and accepted as we grew up. Now, these qualities feel evil to Marie because to recognize and to accept them would threaten the security of her self-image. But the self, with a capital S, the voice of the greater intelligence within her, is showing Marie 
that these elements in her personality are becoming threatening. In some ways, they also picture what she is doing to herself. And she must, in this case, find a way to recognize and integrate them or live with an increasing sense of unhappiness. Now, on this plane, in our psyche, we're dealing with a fairly simple level of evil that, when recognized and integrated, can be transformed to strengthen and broaden who we are. As Marie worked with these images by reflecting upon her history, making associations to the images, and doing active imagination with them, she discovered they represented her ability to achieve worth through attaining desired goals and developing a feeling of control over her life and future. In other words, they were symbolizing her denied sense of personal power. So far, this sounds good. But then Marie realized that by failing to recognize her worth in power, her inner need to do this had taken on a devastating negative capacity that had pursued her relentlessly with self-criticism and self-doubt. She was treating herself like an object without love, respect, and dignity. She also recognized that she was following in her mother's and grandmother's footsteps because she was beginning to create a negative atmosphere around herself that echoed the feelings of misery and scarcity in their lives. She feared that if this negativity continued, she could end up dying of cancer the same way her mother had. Now, there are several important things that we can learn about evil from this simple example. The first one is that to acknowledge the power in these negative images doesn't mean to embrace them. It means to recognize them and to begin to search for the meaning behind them. This is the only way we can discover if the intelligence of the self is directing a part of our individuation process through these dream images. The next thing we can learn is that some kind, kinds of evil, some kinds of negative archetypal energy can be healed and transformed through self-knowledge and integration. The third thing for us to consider is that what we think of as evil can rarely be transformed by direct confrontation. In other words, to fight evil can frequently cause it to strengthen and arm itself in order to fight back. For instance, if Marie tried to directly confront what we might call her negative attitudes, she would most likely find them very resilient. Then her self-criticism would escalate in the face of her struggles and difficulties in trying to overpower these negative aspects of herself that were making her miserable. The fourth thing we might notice is that Marie felt terrified in the dream. Whenever we feel a major emotion, like terror, rage, intense anger, or hurt, we're probably touching a major archetypal issue in our lives that can go in a very destructive direction if we're not careful with it. Overall, I think that we can see that <clears throat> what initially appeared as evil in the dream is a call for Marie to develop more consciousness in order to better fulfill her life and future. Now, the example of Marie's dream shows us that the shadow can two, have two aspects, one that is dangerous and the other that is valuable. Also, as we also saw, whether Marie's shadow became a destructive force in her life or helped her build a new life depended upon the way she approached it through her dream material. However, deciding how to approach these images <clears throat> isn't always so simple. 
as Hume's associate, Dr. Marie Louise von Franz, points out in Chapter 3 of Man and His Symbols. Dr. von Franz quotes a story from the Koran in order to illustrate the paradoxical nature of our shadows of evil and the nature of decisions we face on this journey. Now, Dr. von Franz writes, The ethical difficulties that arise when one meets one's shadow are well described in the 18th book of the Koran. In this tale, Moses meets Keter, the green wand or first angel of God, in the desert. They wander along together, and Keter expresses his fear that Moses will not be able to witness his deeds without indignation. If Moses cannot bear with him and trust him, Keter will have to leave. Presently, Keter scuttles the fishing boat of some poor villagers. Then before Moses' eyes, he kills a handsome young man. <clears throat> and finally, he restores the fallen, <clears throat> the fallen wall of a city of unbelievers. Moses cannot help expressing his indignation, so Keter has to leave him. Before his departure, however, he explains the reasons for his actions. By scuttling the boat, he actually saved it for its owners because pirates were on their way to steal it. As it is, the fishermen can salvage it. The handsome young man was on his way to commit a crime, and by killing him, Keter saved his pious parents from infamy. By restoring the wall, two pious young men were saved from ruin because their treasure was buried beneath it. Moses, who had been so morally indignant, saw too late that his justice had been too hateful. His judgment had been too hasty. Keter's doing had seemed to be totally evil, but in fact they were not. Dr. von Franz continues by saying, looking at the story naively, one might assume that Keter is the lawless, capricious, evil shadow of pious, law-abiding Moses. But this is not the case. Keter is much more the personification of some secret creative actions of the Godhead, or in my language, the creative intelligence of the self. We can see from these examples how in them the Jungian view of the shadow and evil and how we work with them is paradoxical, and how the participation of the intelligence of the self forming our life from within complicates this entire picture. But there are other situations that we need to consider. A few years ago, another woman, Janice, came in to see me with another recurring dream. In this dream, she was being chased through a pitch black movie theater, up one aisle and down the other. A large man was pursuing her with a butcher knife and trying to kill her. Janice told me that her previous therapist suggested to her that she simply stop, turn around, face the man, and embrace him. Then Janice said, I just couldn't do that. It was too scary. And of course, she was right not to do that. We all need to listen to our fear before acting. Options like screaming for help or running out of an exit didn't seem open to her. My response was that the dream was telling her something else. I believe it was telling her that we needed to work very carefully on healing her past, healing her fear, and developing her ability to like, nourish, and take loving care of herself as a support for her becoming more self-reliant and self-empowered. Within a few years, her whole life had changed. Now, it's always interesting 
for me to see how fast our symptoms may recede once we have energetically committed to our inner work. Because Janice was willing to listen to her fear, her dreams, and not to be naive in seeking a solution to it, what seemed at first to be evil and destructive, and what could have been devastating, became a turning point in her life. In a situation like Janice's, the 39th hexagram in the I Ching, obstacles or obstructions, can give us a helpful perspective. In his translation, Richard Wilhelm says in this hexagram, we're facing a dangerous abyss before us and a steep mountain behind us. We cannot retreat or advance. Our obstacles cannot be overcome directly. The advice from the I Ching is to join forces with friends of a like mind and put oneself under the leadership of someone equal to the situation and then listen to them with both ears. R.L. Wing, in his translation of the same hexagram, suggests that like flowing water meeting an obstacle, we must pause and increase in strength and volume until we flow over the obstacle. This is what Janice was doing in her work. She was pausing and through working with her unconscious, building up the inner strength and substance to successfully overflow the obstacles in her life. <clears throat> now let us take a minute to look at another dream. Grady is a middle-aged professional man. By all appearances, he is fairly successful but he is wondering why he has been feeling a loss of energy for over a year, a low-grade sense of misery, and why he wakes up every day with a gnawing sense of dissatisfaction. As we will see shortly, it doesn't make any difference, really, whether he's a doctor, a dentist, a lawyer, a banker, a corporate executive, or whatever. We can all have these kinds of experiences. Grady's recurring dream was that he was in a small city in the desert, probably Iraq, he said. He was in the second story, the top floor of a large house, firing a machine gun. The town was being overrun by an army of terrorists. In the background, a group of Middle Eastern women were making the warlike noises that we hear them make at times in support of the terrorist. Grady knew that if he were caught, he would be tortured and killed. As we discussed the dream, we quickly realized that a desert pictured the emotional landscape that Grady lived in. He lived and worked in a determined way, in an atmosphere that was achievement-oriented, competitive, anxious, and in the negative sense, very patriarchal. There were no feminine values present in his work environment. But what in the world are these terrorists picturing in me, he asked. Can part of me be this evil and brutal? Of course, his self has picked the terrorists for this dream imagery for a reason. We naturally connect terrorists with evil. But the Jungian approach is to always search for the meaning in our images, including the meaning in how to face absolute evil. So Grady and I began to talk about the terrorist. Our discussion went something like this. Terrorists not only want to kill us, they're willing to kill themselves in the process. This attitude shows us a kind of aggression that the psychoanalyst Eric Fromm calls malignant aggression in his books on evil and human destructiveness. Malignant aggression is the kind of aggression that is meant to control life by destroying it and destroying our spirit of life. 
Malignant aggression is purely power-oriented. Its source usually comes from an extreme sense of despair that is based on helplessness and alienation. Now remember that word, alienation. We're going to come back to it. Jung also says that the spirit of evil is fear and the negation of life. Because terrorists like the ones in Grady's dreams are one of the extreme examples of malignant aggression, along with rapists, murderers, assassins, and mass murderers, I want to take a few minutes to explore the source of this kind of evil. And as you reflect on these matters later, you may join me in wondering why these themes are so predominant in our field of entertainment. Now, if we consider for a moment the horror of a high school student shooting teachers and classmates, we need to ask ourselves, what is the source of this kind of evil, this kind of malignant aggression? Is it mental illness? Is it the presence of guns and a culture of violence? Or are these types of things uniting with a deeper symptomatology in our society? Is there a kind of despair that surfaces through our most vulnerable young people? A despair of hopelessness, an inability to find a place in the tribe, or in other words, alienation. Are we forcing our children into lives of feeling externally judged, being members of ability groups, teams, levels of performance, and organizations on a collective scale to the point it is destroying their personal spirit of life? And I think we must also ask ourselves how much the way we have structured our schools reflects the structures that you and I are living by. Later, as we were discussing his dream, Grady said, damn, maybe I've created the center de desert. Maybe I have been so focused on my goals, wanting the best for myself and my family, that I am actively negating some of the life around me. My life. Can the goals I thought were so good, the good intentions I focused my life on, my ideals, actually be fostering these inner terrorists? Now, Grady is beginning to ask himself the right questions. He has to find the courage to face his life realistically, to step out of the cultural brainwashing of his history and to listen to his inner life beginning with the feelings he has denied. At this point, we might ask ourselves, what creates these inner terrorists, and are inner and outer terrorists created in similar ways? Eric Fromm is correct in concluding that despair and alienation create people who seek power, control, and to transcend their situation by violence even to themselves. But we also have to ask ourselves, what happens when entire groups of people become disillusioned, humiliated, and impoverished? When groups feel helpless and hopeless? When the structures of ideals and values that gave purpose and meaning to their lives have collapsed, failed them, or have been taken away from them? and when they may also feel worthless and victimized. In Jungian terms, we would say this group of people has lost the myth that supported their lives. These losses open the door to the archetype of evil to become the foundation of a new myth that brings meaning to them through power and destructiveness. We see examples of this condition in post-World War Germany, in the Middle East today, 
and in fact, in segments in our own society. Now it is also interesting to look at how we can alienate and disenfranchise parts of ourselves until they become desperate actors in our unconscious and in our bodies. As Grady reflected on his dream, he realized that he had focused so intently on his goals and certain values that he had become, in essence, a fundamentalist in how he lived his life. He was structuring himself in a way that disenfranchised and threatened to annihilate parts of himself, his emotional, feminine, and feeling parts. He had lost his sense of knowing how to value his experiences and the way that he was living. And he was beginning to realize that such a loss <coughs> caused him to be unable to value himself as well. He also began to realize that his self with a capital S was sending him a message by showing him that these disowned parts of himself have the power to strike back with force and poignancy. We also concluded that this dream was a gift of warning to him because these forces could escalate their attack into a stroke, a heart attack, or cancer, or some other serious form. The point of this discussion about malignant aggression is that whether it is individual, societal, or personal, it is a call for consciousness, a call for a rock-solid look at our reality, and the courage to see how we hide from life and sabotage ourselves. As Grady began to have an active imagination to dialogue with the leader of the terrorists in his dream, he made some startling discoveries. The leader told him that we in the Middle East are passionate people. We are driven by feelings. Can't you see that we are the passion, the rage, and the love that can connect you to the essentials of life? Can't you see we are pictured as enemies because we are enemies to your arrogant, one-sided, over-controlled approach to life? As he listened to this image in his shadow, Grady was beginning to get a sense of his need for the second kind of aggression that Eric Fromm wrote about. Fromm called this kind of aggression benign aggression. In this kind of aggression, our strength is directed towards preserving life and having a spirit of aggression and adventure in support of life. If Grady can open his attitudes to preserving and fostering his inner life, his strength and energy will increase. So will his capacity to be more loving and more fully alive. He will be able to loosen his passions in how he lives, take more risks, quit dreading failure, and break his internalized cultural condition, traditions. The capacity for benign aggression is a must to protect our love of life, our tender places, and our ability to be creative. When Jung in Collected Works 5 wrote that the spirit of evil is fear and negation, he went on to say that it infuses us with the poison of weakness and regression. He points out that for us to grow and transform, fear must become a challenge and a task because only boldness can deliver us from fear. He continues by saying, that if the risks are not taken to grow, then the meaning of life is somehow violated and the future is condemned to hopeless staleness. As 
Grady pondered his dream, he has gradually experienced his own sense of courage shifting from his former ideals of achievement and overcoming obstacles to preserving life, pursuing his inner journey, and allowing his ambitions to reflect his love of life. Now, talking about dreams of terrorists brings me to another point, and that is how do we respond when we have to look evil in the face? Jung makes a striking statement when he says in Ion that it's quite within the bounds of possibility for a man to recognize the relative evil of his nature. But it is a rare and shattering experience for him to gaze into the face of absolute evil. But this is exactly what we have to do. When <coughs> this is exactly what we have to face as well. When we run into a person, a group, or a society that has come, become possessed by the archetype of evil or possessed by myth dominated by this archetype. How can we face unrelenting malignant aggression? Well, I must admit that I don't really know the answer to that question. But there are two lines of thinking that inform me. The first thing that I think is that we must do our best to take a clear moral stand against this kind of evil. This means that we must stand with strength and use the full force of benign aggression to preserve and protect life, even if it means we must become completely ruthless in our actions. And we must remember that to slip into denial, sentimental idealism, or to fight evil half-heartedly opens us to being contaminated and even absorbed by it. But we must stand not only with strength, but also with great humility, not righteousness. The nature of life teaches us repeatedly that we are unable to see the evil in the good and the good that is in the evil taking place in our lives. Some of you may remember that in Gerda's great poetic drama, Faust, we find Mistopheles, the devil in the drama, complaining that people don't appreciate him because they don't realize that without him, Nothing would ever happen in the world. When asked by Faust who he is, he replies that he is part of that force which would do evil, yet forever works for the good. So in the face of absolute evil, I think we must be able to respond with strength and, if necessary, ruthlessness, and yet with humility and a renewed search for consciousness. There is another question we have to face as well. What happens when we are the victim of absolute evil? I have worked with people who have been tortured, abused as children, and held as sex slaves. I can easily understand that these situations can be more than the human heart can stand. And yet deep in our souls, there is the possibility of the resilience and the depth of our humanity that can heal and transcend these experiences. In order to illustrate this possibility, I would like to share a story with you that informs me. It is part of Sir Lawrence Vanderpost's story, which he relates in the DVD interview with him, titled Hasten Slowly. Sir Lawrence is the author of over 20 books, was a great friend and a biographer of Jung. As a British officer, he spent most of World War II in a Japanese prison of war camp for British soldiers. And from that experience, he tells this story. I remember a particularly nasty execution 
which my friend Nicholas and I had to stand in formation with our young officers to watch. They were executing two soldiers who had gotten too close to the prison fence. The way these soldiers died was indescribably moving. One was tied between two posts, driven into the ground, and they had bayonet practice on him. The other was beheaded as he knelt on the ground. At the moment the execution started, a British officer standing between Nicholas and myself, who was frail because he had been tortured, began to collapse. I said to myself, this mustn't happen because it will spread. I felt we must face this upright and look it in the eye. And I put my arm around this man in a way the Japanese couldn't see to hold him up. As I did so, I felt Nicholas from the other side instinctively doing the same thing. I felt the officer between us straighten up. We stood and looked at the man being bayoneted. I wanted to look away and pretend it wasn't happening. But a voice inside of me said, you can't do that because you would be betraying the man who is being killed if you do that. You must go through it with him. That is your contribution here and now. You must go through it. You must be killed with him if you're going to understand what is going on. This story has informed me as I live and work. For years, it has helped me look to reality, including suffering and evil in the eye. It has helped me work with people who have suffered horrible things. And it might, makes me thank God that I have never faced evil in this way. And it also makes me thank God for how in the face of such evil, the human spirit can respond with a depth of consciousness and humanity that can inspire and inform us all. As I bring these reflections on evil to a close, I want to say that I realize we have followed what may have seemed to be a confusing path between the inner world and the outer world between the personal and different individuals and groups, between what we think of as our shadows and what we think of as the archetypal nature of evil. The fact is that the nature of what I am talking about is quite confusing. Both shadow and evil have archetypal foundations that are frequently intertwined. But there is a thread that runs through all of these circumstances around evil that I have been mentioning. That thread is that evil is a call, perhaps a demand from life, for us to develop a more profound sense of self-knowledge and consciousness. It may help us to remember another well-known quotation from Hume when he passionately says in an interview, that the world hangs by a slender thread, and that thread is the consciousness of man. We are the great danger. What if something goes wrong with the psyche, but we know nothing about it? And it seems that if we are well fed and clothed, we have little urge to learn about ourselves, and that is our greatest mistake of all. In the few examples I have given, we can see an important truth. Evil, as it is symbolized in our shadows, is a call for consciousness, for wholeness, and for completing the pattern for the development of our lives that is inherent in our greater self. And each time we integrate part of our shadow, we reduce the evil in the world. But when we fail to do this, to confront and integrate our shadow, we add to the truth of the statement 
that the theologian Reinhold Niebuhr made in the mid-20th century, that most evil is not done by evil people, but by good people who don't know what they're doing. Jung helped us to understand that it's important to become conscious of evil, and that we as individuals and as a society cannot learn to deal with the complexities of evil until we can truly acknowledge evil and confront it as a reality. I believe that the evil we face in the world has the purpose of calling or compelling us out of our childlike state of unconsciousness, our obsession with the good life, the happy life, the secure life, and to force us to engage in the blood, sweat, risk, tears, love, and laughter of real life. And while absolute evil may not be able to be integrated, it can perhaps awaken us to our better selves and our need to look for the kind of consciousness that Dr. Hume thought our future depended on. Thank you. Thank you.